you so much. I know you guys have had a long day, so I appreciate you sticking it out. Um, the first thing I did want to just very briefly talk about is I know that a colleague was going to speak earlier about who to choose as an executor, and ironically, she's at a funeral, so she wasn't able to come. So I just thought I would just take just a couple quick minutes just simply to review my thoughts on who you should be thinking about and who you should be checking, um, uh, appointing as an executor. So at a very high level, your choices are someone in your family, a friend, a bank, or an institution. There's a lot of uh, banks like Scotia, they have a a program called Estate Assist. RBC has a great estates uh, program as well. And then you also have your professionals. You could appoint your accountant, your lawyer, your advisor. So you have a, a very wide gamut of people to consider. And sometimes we get so wrapped up and worried about the immediate family unit, we don't remember the other options. Um, in terms of factors as to which way you should go, the first thing is you can name more than one. And if you don't say how, they automatically have to be jointly together, which means one can't do anything without the other. They have to go to the lawyer together. They have to go to the bank together. They do everything together. You can appoint two people, three people, joint and several. So that's a convenience factor so that one person can just go ahead and act alone. But now you have the risk factor of one person can go and do this alone. So when someone says that they want that, I kind of bring them back to the beginning of, well, why are we naming three other people if you trust this person implicitly? Um, family dynamics, it's so hard. Don't choose your executor out of guilt. Don't do it. Everybody wants to and says, I just feel so bad. Don't. If somebody's healing, feelings are hurt or somebody's upset, you're dead. You don't have to listen to it anyway. So don't do it for guilt, OK? Um, the other thing to think about is whether or not the person you want to choose lives in the province or out of province. Uh, generally speaking, out of province executors are required to post a security bond. Why? Because the court's afraid that they're going to get control and access of the money and leave. As soon as the money leaves Ontario, it's going to be a lot harder for us to get it back. Now, you can ask for an exception and a waiver. You can actually, in your will, say, I trust this person and, there, and there's no reason for them to post a bond. It usually works, but I just warn people that that is not binding to a judge. They usually defer to it, but if there's anything going on and a judge doesn't like it, he doesn't have to honor it. So keep that, keep that in mind as well. Um, also keep in mind that under the Trustee Act, executors are entitled to be paid for their time. It's a lot of work, I think you now know, uh, from previous uh, speakers. And it's about 2.5% of the receipts, whoops, two and a half percent of the disbursements. So all the money you collect and bring in, all the money that they disperse out. So it's about roughly five percent. If you're hiring a bank or an institution or a lawyer or an accountant, you know you'll be paying the, the executor fee. Sometimes within family members, sometimes they don't take it to be fair to their other siblings. But it is a lot of time and effort, and it does take quite a bit. Um, if you do hire a professional, whether if it's an institution or your accountant, for instance, make sure that you have a fee agreement and arrangement with them now so that it's clearly understood what they get paid for and what they don't get paid for. Uh, so I highly recommend that. Um, so I think that's really all I wanted to, to kind of throw out there in terms of who to choose for an executor, and all the different dynamics. It, there really are a lot of factors to consider, um, as well as 
thinking about that people mourn differently. Everyone says, oh, my kids will get along. They don't. They won't. <laughs> Everybody mourns differently. You might have someone who's OK and accepting at the moment, and you have a sister or brother who's depressed, and then you have someone who's angry. Trying to get those three people to work together, it's, it's a nightmare. It, it creates a lot of problems. If they don't agree, now what? If you name two people and they don't agree, what are we going to do? We're at gridlock. Well, you're going to have to go to a judge and sort it out, get direction. Now you're wasting money and time. So, uh, so definitely think about all those factors and don't make your decision out of guilt. That's the best thing I can say about that. Um, now, there are a lot of mistakes, but this is not an official. OK, now I'm doing it. There we go. Uh, this is not an official list. This is just from my practice experience, what I see and what I think are the most common issues and mistakes that, that come up with executors. Um, I wanted to just point out, I believe you went through all of this earlier in case you missed it or just as a very quick recap. CIBC did a study a couple of years ago and they said that they found that a very simple, straightforward estate had 89 tasks for the executor to do. That's with everything going perfect. So it's a lot of work. Everything from securing and collecting the assets, applying for the probate certificate, paying for debts, tax returns, accounting, and then actually distributing. So, so it's a lot of work. So with that, it's very easy to make mistakes. So the first mistake I want to talk about is that people assume, and why it would just be so logical. Here's the will. I'm going to do exactly what it tells me. How can I go wrong? Well, we have other laws that may conflict with that will. So we have to be very, very careful that we understand the will versus the law, if you will. We need to consider, particularly in second marriages, did the person provide adequately? That's an actual legal ground for a couple different claims. For the first six months, never, ever, ever disperse anything, especially in a second marriage, um, because there is an election that is entitled the, by the spouse to take. And what this election is, is it falls under the Family Law Act. And it says, if I, my husband didn't give me enough in the will, then I'm going to take under the Family Law Act because I'll get more money. You can't disinherit a spouse. So, and that's a legally married spouse, not common law. So you really want to make sure that you've waited that six month gap from the date of death to make sure that no one, that the spouse, surviving spouse, isn't going to make a claim against the estate. If you dole out money and then all of a sudden you have a lawsuit, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting that money back. Um, the other type of claim, and this is a different six months, because it start, the clock starts ticking the day that you get your certificate issued, appointing you by the court as, your exec, as the executor. From six months, anybody who claims to be a dependent can file a lawsuit against the estate saying, I was not financially adequately provided for, and I depended on this person. I lived with them for free. They provided my living. <laughs> they, it's, therefore, it could be found that they're a dependent. They didn't leave me anything in the will. And, um, and therefore, through that law, they can, under the Succession Law Reform Act, start a claim against the estate. So those are two very, very important six-month rules um, that, that the executor needs to understand and to make sure that these have expired before they give anybody any money. 
Mistake number two, paying in the wrong order. I love this one, um, particularly because of the, the second point. The very first thing that's entitled to be paid is funeral expenses. Anything related to the funeral um, are allowed to be paid out first. Then you have to pay debts and taxes. If there is specific bequests, the ring, the watch, the painting, then those get to go out. If there's specific money, I give my grandchild $5,000, then those gifts go out. What's left is called the residue. So I always pretend to have a bucket where I'm taking in all the money and I'm paying out what I need to. It's what's left in the bucket. So it's the net estate. The residue is then ready to be distributed. If you do it in the wrong order, where you're gonna get into trouble is if you run out of money. You didn't realize how much debt the deceased had. And there's a very specific order of abatement, it's called, of basically, who do you take away from first and how? So it's a very specific order. And if you, if you get yourself into a situation that you say, holy cow, I gave away the painting and I gave away the $5,000 gift and I just found out that they owe 10,000 to a bank on a credit card I didn't know about. So definitely that's when you need to go see a lawyer, go see a professional to help because you don't want to be held responsible for doling things out in the wrong order or for abating the wrong things, doing the abatement in the wrong order. So that's really uh, important. And speaking of debt, so along the traditional way of posting a legal notice to creditors, it's a public little ad that we used to pay in the newspaper. And, and as I, I remember coming across them and thinking, it's such an odd thing. Why would I want to advertise that I'm dead? Well, here's why. If the executor does a legal notice and posts it for three consecutive weeks, the creditor has 90 days to respond. After 90 days, the creditor may be able to go to the estate, but if there's no money, even if the money was paid out, they can't turn to the executor personally and say, that estate owed me money. So this now actually stands as a protection for the executor. Now, the reason why a lot of people don't like doing this is the average cost is about $1,000 in the Toronto Sun to do this. It's insane. But I'm super excited because a judge just recently declared that there's an online service. It's called Notice Connect. They're amazing people. And they are providing an online digital service of posting your legal notices for you. They charge $140. So it couldn't be easier. It couldn't be cheaper. I think it's an amazing tool for the protection of the executor to absolutely make sure that they are posting legal notice and that they're taking advantage of the new technology to, um, to certainly relieve themselves from, from that. Early distributions. This is probably the biggest, I think, that I see, and it's also where I see a lot of litigation. I want to remind the executors, you are in charge. Don't succumb to the pressure of the beneficiaries. People come out of the woodworks all of a sudden. Yeah. Ah, where's my money? Where's my gift? They promised me, they promised me I want to see the will. And, and oh, and who, who gets to look at the will? Well, the, the residual people, the final beneficiaries, they receive a copy of the entire will. If granddaughter Susie Q gets $5,000, she's only allowed to see her paragraph. Other than that, they're not, no one is entitled just to go see the will. Now, once you go through probate, it does become a public document, 
but a lot of nosy people and your favorite aunts and all sorts of people come in and say, I want a reading of the will. Well, that's in the movies. So, <laughs> and it's about people think that they have entitlements to it, but they don't. So don't, don't worry about that. But in terms of making early distributions, if you say, okay, well, I paid the taxes, I think I've got everything out of, under control, I've waited the two six months, and mm -hmm. I'm now sitting on you know, $50,000, so I'm going to give the two beneficiaries $25,000 each, you write them a check, you walk away. Three months later, CRA, well, we had to reassess his tax bill from two years ago, and you're actually, you're short $5,000. Uh-oh, you're gonna have a lot of trouble because when you call up those beneficiaries and say, whoops, I made a mistake, can you send some of that back? They're gonna say, no. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's your problem, that's your job. Take it out of your part. So it's very, very important that you wait for a clearance certificate from CRA. Typically when the accountant does the last return, this is something that they can request for you. So make sure that they do. Once you get that clearance certificate, you know that the CRA can't turn on you because they're admitting and they're certifying, we approve all the history and we approve all the taxes and we're good. So absolutely do that. In terms of the estate information return, that's the return that Kat was talking about earlier um, with the Minister of Finance. They, you know, they're, they've been very interesting to deal with the last two years. They don't provide a receipt and they don't provide you confirmation of, we received it, we approve it, you're good. But if you request it, they will send you, they're calling it a comfort letter, how nice. And this comfort letter at least exonerates you and it gives you that paper evidence of I did my job, I did the return, we haven't heard anything, they acknowledged it, so I'm good. Waiting for the legal notice that I talked about earlier to expire so that you know that um, that uh, general creditors have two years against an estate. So we wanna make sure we've ruled all of that out. Possible claims against the estate, that's the original, the two six month rules that I talked about earlier. So there's lots of things that you need to wait for. And I don't want you to be afraid to tell, to tell the beneficiaries, my job, I have a huge fiduciary <clears throat> duty. I know you want your money, but you were fine yesterday when they were alive so you'll be fine to wait for the process to be done properly so that I know I'm giving you the right amount and that I'm allowed to give you the right amount. So definitely take charge. The one thing that you can do is let's say you have a larger estate that you're dealing with and say we have $500,000 left in our pot. Based last tax return, the deceased owed $2,000, we've paid off credit cards. So it really looks like you're gonna be okay. What you can do is say, okay, beneficiaries, I'm gonna make you a partial payment to give you something so that you don't have to wait for all of this. But I'm not gonna give you everything so that I have some money in my back pocket just in case something comes up that we're not expecting. So maybe you'll dole out 400,000 and hold back 100,000. Again, it's about protecting yourself because as soon as something goes wrong, they're gonna point at you. They're gonna say, you owed us a duty. You were supposed to get help. You were supposed to know. I see it every day, every day. So don't let them bully you or pressure you um, into payments if you are gonna do an early distribution, you can, but definitely think, do I have enough money still left in my pocket in case something else comes up? So accounting. So under, with those fiduciary duties, 
you are responsible for providing the residue beneficiaries with the full accounting. So you need to keep very clear records. You need to open an estate account and only operate, have all the ins and outs come from this one estate account. Don't commingle it or combine it with another account that the deceased had maybe or that you have, but it only had $10 in it, so we'll just use that. Open an estate account specific for this purpose. Show a summary of all the assets and all the liabilities. You're gonna have a summary sheet showing all the receipts and disbursements. And then you'll show a, have a sheet doing the calculation for compensation so that you have it all laid out that it's a very nice clear account of every single penny that, that you touched. You can show the beneficiary where it went minus maybe that early distribution. Therefore, this is what's left. And this is the last piece that I'm giving you. When you are about to give that last check, don't give it to them unless they have signed a release saying, yes, you did your job. You did the accounting and provided it to me. And I agree and approve it. They sign it. Here's your money. Because what you don't want is them to take the money and then go get a lawyer saying they cheated me. Now we're sitting here with no money <laughs> and a lawsuit. So make sure, so those releases with accounting, it's so important. And the more, the clearer accounting and your records and your paperwork, the clearer the better. Make it just so simple for them to follow that they, that they'll be embarrassed for asking a question. Just lay it all out, have them sign a release, and then they can get their last, um, the, their last check. Best advice. I wish I could bring, I don't know if Kat is still here. I wish I could bring her everywhere I go. She's amazing. Her knowledge and her advice, I thought was just brilliant. Really brilliant, she's amazing. Um, absolutely seek professional advice. As an executor, you can do that. Now, the difference, and some people get a little confused about, well, does it come out of my compensation or does the estate pay for it? And that's a really good question. The answer is, it depends. If you're hiring them, the accountant, let's say, to do the tax return, that's a specialty that requires a professional to do. So therefore, the estate would cover that expense. If you say, accountant, um, I need you to go run to the bank and do all these errands and handle all of these checks for me and hand deliver them, and he sends you a $500 bill, that's something for, that you could have done yourself. That's coming out of your compensation. So there's a very clear line as to what I can do on my own versus what I should get a professional you know, advice or help with. So everyone from your accountant to your advisor, someone like Kat, absolutely. I'd have her on the list if I had listened to her first. Um, and, and of course, an estates lawyer. Don't go to the lawyer without any disrespect to my colleagues. Don't go to the lawyer who's around the corner and says that they do wills for a hundred bucks or something. No, you need to call Law Society and say, I need to speak to an estates lawyer. Can you refer someone to me in my area? And through their system, they will go through and they'll say, they'll match you with an estates lawyer that's, that's close to your area. So you want to make sure, because the estates lawyer has to know and understand all the ins and outs and be current on all of these six month rules and everything else in order to protect you and to give you the best advice. So don't be afraid to seek that advice and don't be afraid because sometimes it's worth it, even if money is coming from the estate or even if it's coming from your pocket because you're unsure, it's worth it because ultimately 
It's your fiduciary duty to the estate that can be held responsible.